So my name is Heather Miller. I'm, I recently became a professor at CMU. I just started like four weeks ago, so bar thank you. Thank you, I'm barely a, prof <laughs> I'm barely a professor there. Um, prior to that, I was the, um, the executive director of this thing called the Scala Center for a couple of years. Uh, and I was also um, uh, at Northeastern University in Boston um, as a faculty member there. Uh, so I, I kind of, for the last several years, I've sort of spent time li living both in industry land a little bit um, in the sense that, you know, I, I was working on this, this open source foundation and then trying to help it uh, grow and help, uh, help, you know, hire engineers to do things that we need to do for the Scala programming language. Um, and then at the same time, I was off trying to do research and teach. Uh, so I kinda, I'm kind of weird because I'm not sure how to identify. <laughs> am, I, am I an academic? Probably. Uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm a little bit more interested in what people actually do. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about um, really, uh, it's, it's, mostly, it's mostly gonna be research because I think it can be inspirational. Um, and I mean, I, you know, I guess I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't love research. Um, but you know, counter to maybe what most people think or the way most people see research, I actually think that it's extremely animated. Um, it's just you know, maybe weirdly animated. It doesn't look like it from the outside. In fact, I think a lot of the time this is how people view research. It's just like a bunch of PDFs and somebody hiding in a cave reading them. Um, and information is very hard to obtain that's in these things. And also they're behind paywalls and oh my god. Um, however, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I actually, I actually think that research is a little bit more dynamic. Um, and I, I think that this view of, of, okay, you know, an academic is somebody hiding in a cave, writing, uh, you know, complicated, you know, mathy things in PDF form, uh, making contrived motivational statements about, you know, real world problems that lock, lack real world context. Like, I don't think that's actually true. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, I think that uh, research is actually more like this, where it's a bunch of, I mean, it's, it evolves very weirdly slowly. Uh, you've got a bunch of people kind of chasing some strange goal that nobody else can understand until afterwards, right? We get it later, often. Um, and these are multi-year, sort of very long uh, animated debates, actually, um, where you have people making points uh, via these weird PDFs and arguing, oh, is it this way or is it that way? Um, and uh, I think it's actually, you know, if you can zoom out a little bit and, and sort of, you know, look at how these, these research papers kind of connect and then sort of provide a dialogue about, you know, what event, you know, some sort of dialogue, um, you know, I think, I think actually research can be very exciting even though it seems not exciting. Um, and so, uh, you know, last year I actually gave a talk uh, at, the papers, at the Papers We Love conference, and I uh, kind of gave a retrospective of the last, like, 30 years of distributed programming languages. And that was actually really easy to try and give, like, a quick, sort well, you know, a fun, hilarious little tour of, um, because, you know, a lot of these topics were rather settled. For example, um, Argus, which was a really cool programming language, never caught on in practice. But we all got promises from Argus, so that's pretty cool, right? So these things were largely resolved, and it was kind of easy to tell this story over the course of, you know, 50 minutes or something that I had, you know, because you had like 30 years. Um, and this talk, I kind of wanted to do something similar, but I wanted to do it, you know, more recently. So rather than give, you know, a retrospective of stuff that's largely past, I figured what would be the most useful for everybody in this room would be, if you're interested in distributed programming, what the heck is going on? <laughs> like, what, you know, what, what are people doing? How is it going to help? Uh, and how do these things kind of relate to one another? So um, really, you know, I, I, what I want to give you in this talk is, is actually context. Um, I want to give you a, really like a whirlwind tour kind of of the last 10 or so years of, of research relating to um, programming language support, a compiler support for distributed uh, programming. Um, and at this point, I'm going to point out uh, that, you know, this is this kind of, maybe this is my personal sort of interest, and so things end up going in this direction a little bit. Uh, when I talk about language support for distributed systems, I'm, I'm really meaning uh, ways that the compiler or the programming language can help you uh, build a distributed application. So I'm not really interested uh, in this talk to talk about things like, um, you know, verifying things or model checking or things like that. I'm actually interested more in like languages and compilers, so it's gonna be a little bit more the focus today. Um, 
And I mean, okay, this is, you know, there's absolutely, actually like, you know, there's, the axes mean nothing here, but let's just, <laughs> let's have some intuition for a second. If I could visually depict uh, all of the various research projects in this distributed programming space over the last, you know, X years, uh, turns out that weird clusters appear uh, around certain topics. I mean, maybe not weird, it makes sense to me why these exist. Um, but I mean, you know, Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list, <laughs> but uh, there, in the last few years, there's been a bunch of, um, of, of renewed interest in looking at programming models and how they relate to consistency and consistency models. So how do you deal with consistency from the perspective of the programming language or the programming model? Um, session types are, I'm gonna briefly talk about them uh, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, it's another, another idea for trying to make it easier to uh, make sure that protocols are correct, distributed protocols are correct. Um, and then there's a very, very, very active space around sort of static analysis and verification of distributed algorithms and things like that. Um, and then there's, oh, then there's other, there's other work that doesn't quite neatly fit into one of these nice categories. I'm gonna talk about a few of those things, but to get, you know, again, today, because I'm really interested in programming languages and programming models, I'm gonna talk more about these other things. I'm not gonna really talk about um, static analysis and verification. However, I have a really detailed uh, like list of references in case you're interested where things are like nicely categorized in case you want to read about the verification efforts. Um, but the first thing I'll talk about, uh, so again, this is a whirlwind tour. So I'm just gonna give you a taste um, of what these things, what's going on nowadays. And these things, like I said, they're all largely in the last few years. Um, and okay, consistency in programming models, what do I mean? Well, I mean, you know, a programming model that can, you know, we're, we're interested in sort of in the research world in a programming model that can provide some kind of guarantee about the consistency in a distributed system. Uh, and an example of what I mean by that, um, and this is an example, there are many possible examples. Uh, let's say you have a replica of some object or some piece of data, uh, and you know, you want, this is like a shared piece of mutable data. You, know, you have a local, local copy of it, and maybe there's some other node somewhere updating something related to this piece of data, and you want to have whatever you know, updates that other people are making to that piece of data, that, you know, where you are. Um, so what guarantees do I have uh, about you know, what others see? If I update that piece of data, or if somebody else updates that piece of data, what, do they, what, kind, of, you know, what kind of guarantees do I have about, you know, do we see the same thing? Or when I update it, do you see the same thing that I wrote? Um, so this is kind of what I mean, con you know, conceptually. Um, and sort of the, the, the standard thing is that, you know, we, you know, forget about distributed systems for a moment, we tend to assume sort of strong consistency, which is, uh, you know, in the sort of, I'm on one machine, I'm just updating some data, um, you know, this, you know, most of the time everybody can see that, that update, right? Um, and, uh, you know, this notion of strong consistency carries over to distributed systems where you can ensure that, uh, you know, there's a bunch of synchronization in the system and everybody sees the same thing, right? Uh, and uh, recently, what's become interesting to look at um, is, you know, this idea of weak consistency. People have realized, well, okay, I mean, not 100% of the time is it important for this piece of data to be, for every, all, the whole system to be synchronizing on some piece of data. I mean, perhaps in the case of like a bank account, it would be good. However, if we're talking about like a like counter on Facebook, it's not so important perhaps that, you know, everything's synchronized, right? Um, so this has gotten to be popular at least uh, recently. Uh, but it's actually really, I mean, you know, conceptually it's kind of simple to imagine, right? Like, all right, I'm gonna, you know, whatever, we, we will eventually, I will eventually see what he sees, right? Um, straightforward just to, to think about, but actually quite difficult to uh, ensure that actually happens in practice. Um, there are many ways <laughs> to ruin, uh, you know, this consistency when, you know, you allow all kinds of things not to be like locking and things to be, you know, done out of order, right? Um, so it's actually difficult to obtain, uh, and this is kind of why there's a bunch of research on this topic in, in recent years. Um, and I mean, you know, a lot of this actually comes out, I mean, I, I think a lot of people have, have heard of this cap theorem thing. Um, it's one of two impossibility results that gets a lot of attention. I'm not sure it, it deserves all the attention that it gets, but uh, the sort of intuition is, is kind of important here. Um, and I, I don't know if you've seen this before, but there's this, this cute pyramid that people like to, to draw up, uh, and they, you know, there's the, the hey, pick two, um, where on one end we have um, uh, consistency, so that's, oops, oops, whoa, how did linearizability jump? That should be down there. All right, pretend that on this slide, that's there. Um, linear, <laughs> the availability and linearizability, it makes sense. 
Um, okay? But uh, so consistency is essentially linearizability. Just don't worry about that for now. We kind of talked about what that means. Um, availability is basically means that uh, every request that, uh, you know, is received by something that has not failed, um, you know, must result in some kind of response that's not an error itself. So, you know, and basically means that, you know, something can give a result. I mean, simply put. Uh, and partition tolerance basically means that, uh, you know, it can deal with some sort of issue in the network, some sort of something, uh, there's delays in the network or uh, messages might be dropped for some reason. Um, and so these are the three sort of variables, right? And um, uh, this, this sort of cap theorem uh, basically, basically says pick two. Um, and what that has resulted in is a lot of attention sort of being focused on one edge of that, of that, of that pyramid where the, what, we, what we picked uh, was, uh, it was, a, whoa, uh, oops. So yeah, people like to, to say, okay, I pick uh, um, availability and partition tolerance, for example. Uh, so you'll see lots of like AP model or whatever. Um, but basically, uh, oops, man, I'm going forward and backwards. All right, so there's, a, there's this piece of work which I think probably a lot of people have heard the acronym for by now. Um, they're called CRDTs. And, uh, from a high level, you can think of these things as basically being um, replicated data structures. Uh, so these are things that you can copy all over the network and make local updates to it, and then you can be guaranteed that the uh, you know everybody will eventually see the same uh, eventually see the same result, like whenever updates eventually stop. Um, so and and what we're training here. So like I said, this is a, an AP thing because you know we get availability and uh, partition tolerance, but we're we're sort of sacrificing consistency. We have weak consistency, right? Um, and this is very popular. I, I don't know if anybody's heard of React, but uh, it's a it's a data it's a it's a it's a data store that has CRDTs built into it. A bunch of other um, popular frameworks in the industry have also had these things sort of put into them. Uh, I believe Akka has it now. Um, but this is kind of a nice, uh, a nice sort of model, and, and it's gotten a lot of attention. And I show just one paper. There's going to be a bunch of other papers in the, the sort of list of references that you know you guys can look at if you really want to later. Which you know this, this goes in many other directions, trying to make these things more efficient, uh, looking at all the different kinds of data structures that satisfy the properties of a CRDT. Um, you know, basically, can I have some weird uh, data structure that is very specific for my application? I don't know, have some kind of, uh, you know, have the list of, of properties that are required for it to be a CRDT and for there to be strong eventual consistency guaranteed. Um, so this is kind of a, a popular sort of area that has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. Um, and, you know, building on that, uh, on the whole parallel, I'm sorry, on the whole programming model front, um, you've got you know, works like this one. Um, this is a good friend of mine, Chris Micklejohn. Uh, he is, he, a few years back with Peter Van Roy built a, like a kind of a DSL or a little programming language built on top of these, these data structures. So rather than just having these little data structures, uh, you can actually maybe build up more interesting programs with like higher order functions and things uh, and compose things together. So you have kind of a nice functional language built on top of these things. So this is sort of one step on top of that CRDT work. Um, and then at the same time, you know, people ask, again, Chris is asking questions, well, um, you know, what about this, this pyramid, this weird pyramid that, that, that uh, uh, you know, can I, can, why is everybody looking at kind of one edge of it? Let's maybe, you know, play around with different sorts of space or different sorts of uh, areas on that, on that pyramid. Um, and uh, he, he has, you know, there's a, a cute little program model he proposed, uh, which basically aims to um, provide consistency and availability. Um, uh, so basically, the idea, you know, so just to, to quote, to directly quote his paper, so he's got this programming model that he proposed called Spry, um, and it's, it wants to trade off availability and consistency at varying, varying points in the application code, and he provides um, a number of applications. One of them is a CDN, um, but in the end, you know, what, what he's really giving to you as a programmer, like as, in the programming model, uh, is a way to bound staleness and freshness via annotation. So is a result too stale? Uh, you know, or, you know, how fresh do I need something to be? Uh, so, you know, this is sort of, again, playing around on that distributed, sort of, sort of that programming model space of this problem that, you know, the, the, of the, the famous pick two problem. Um, and there's a bunch of other um, cool pieces of work that have also come out sort of, you know, saying, well, fine, um, these programming models are kind of restrictive. 
I don't know if I want everything in my distributed system to be, you know, weakly consistent and have to deal with this eventual consistency. Um, what, if I, what if I have a programming model that lets me do multiple things? Um, and this actually came out of the distributed systems community, so if you actually, like, dig around in the research, you're gonna find that a lot of this talk about programming models for these underlying things, they usually are in the, the programming languages space. Uh, but this came out of uh, the distributed systems community in 2015, and it's, a, it's an abstraction called correctables. It, it, it relates to futures um, in that you have these, these kind of callbacks that you can implement. Um, and uh, they are, they basically provide different, each of the callbacks provide different uh, consistency guarantees. So, um, I mean, the really high level sort of quick glance of this, of this system is that, you know, as you have something that's like a future, uh, and you can choose the consistency guarantees that you need. Um, so there are these three APIs. Uh, so obviously the first two either allow strong or weak consistency for whatever operation you pass to it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, basically they let you kind of make a decision in the, uh, in the, in the, um, in the programming model about you know, when you need strong consistency or when you need weak consistency, you can do this at the level of like the application code. Um, and uh, something that's a little bit more complicated that's in the paper, uh, you can actually specify, you know, like, you know, you can kind of make like a spectrum of, <laughs> of how strong or weak you want it to be with this other, this other method. Um, I encourage you to have a look at the paper for more. Uh, and there's another piece of work that just came out this year, actually. Um, it was in PLDI uh, in, in June. Um, and this is basically uh, another programming model that lets you uh, sort of choose different consistency um, models at the level of the programmer, right? Uh, and then this is different from the last one in that uh, instead what you're doing is you can um, sort of mix uh, consistency models by uh, uh, you, you can, like, there, there are different remote sto storage sites that you can have associated with different consistency models, basically. And this is a, actually like a, a programming language or a DSL, um, I believe, uh, which does sort of extra type checking and it does sort of information flow-based type checking to sort of guarantee that you're not mixing things in the wrong way um, so that, you know, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't mix the, you know, the wrong consistency models together uh, in some subsequent operation later. Um, and so this is just a quick glance. Um, I have, again, I'm gonna show you uh, in a few minutes um, some more, you know, just like a laundry list of, of, of more papers that you could look at if you're ever interested in looking any deeper than what I've just showed you. But um, sort of the high level summary of this is that, um, you know, when we realize that, hey, sometimes our applications can tolerate weak consistency, it got to be popular to say, hey, uh, let's play around with this. Let's have uh, data structures or other sort of um, uh, programming models that let us sort of trade off on consistency. Uh, and then people started asking other questions. Well, can we have multiple models of consistency and the same programming model? Or even better, like, can we have different things? Like, can we just focus on availability instead? I mean, I don't care too much about consistency. I mean, I don't know why you would not care, but whatever. Uh, some people, I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's an interesting question, right? Like, what other sort of spaces on the, in, the, in this little funny triangle can we explore? And this has sort of been something that's been popular in probably the last, you know, just exploring the different, uh, the different mixing the models and, and the different sorts of mixture, or in the different sorts of po points in this design space. And um, this has only been in, like, the last four or five years that people have been even playing around with this in mass, I guess. There's a lot of people, a lot of work going on in this space. Um, another thing which, um, so my research is actually more related to this consistency stuff, I'm more interested in that. Something else that's very popular, that people, a lot of people are very interested in uh, in the last few years is this idea of session types. Um, so I don't know, you, you might have heard the, you know, it's a buzzword. Um, I'm gonna give you a really, uh, again, some intuition about what these things are. Um, but, you know, what you can think of at a high level is the session types provide a way to type communication protocols. So you can have, uh, you know, you can basically make the assumption that if your program type checks, uh, then it's guaranteed to follow the, the defined communication protocol. Um, and I mean, you know, to me, like what that means is I don't have random machines hanging, waiting for something that, you know, should have gone to some, I don't know, like there's something messed up where you got some partial result, you messed up the implementation of this protocol and, uh, you know, three, three machines are timing out somewhere because the communication protocol is screwed up. Basically, you, you completely remove that possibility from happening. 
Um, so this is wonderful, right? Because I can't tell you how many, how much, how many headaches are uh, you know I have, I have, I have dealt with uh, trying to deal with some messed up communication protocol or which I've heard or read about. Um, so this is a really wonderful guarantee to be able to sort of uh, aspire to, right? Um, and what's also interesting to note um, is there are also many types because this is a very busy space uh, in recent years. Um, so you, know, you might, if you start Googling this to learn more, um, you're gonna notice that there's something called binary session types and multi-party session types. Um, and that basically means, you know, uh, can I, you know, does this, does this, this typing of this, um, you know, between, you know, nodes, is it between two nodes or more than two nodes, basically? So binary is basically, um, you know, between two, two parties and multi-party can be more. Um, and then uh, there also exist uh, static and dynamic um, variants. So uh, there exists, I mean, as you can imagine, you know, you have a, a statically typed language, you would probably end up with a static uh, session types system. And there exists also uh, session typing sort of implementations and realizations for languages like Python. Uh, so there's this static dynamic divergence there. Um, and I, I, uh, I basically tried to find, because I don't work on this myself, I tried to find a good, very simple example that I could very quickly provide. Uh, and I have to give props to Simon Fowler, who works on uh, session types, and, and specifically in a programming language called Lynx. Um, he has a really cute example that I, I liked a lot, and I recommend reading, reading his introduction if you're interested in session types. Um, so basically, uh, what you have is kind of like a type definition on the client and on the, the server side. And here we are looking at the client side, and you have this funny plus symbol thingy here. Uh, and what that basically means is that, you know, you have two, two branches that you can choose between. Uh, on the one hand, you have the, oh, sorry, I should have pointed out, I just started talking about the example. This is an example implementation of SMTP, sorry. Um, so the SMTP client side, um, we have uh, these two branches, the EHLO branch, uh, where you have, this is basically just a bunch of pieces of information that you want to have, have sent. So in this case, um, you have the client sending with the bang symbol, uh, the, the, basically the domain, um, the address uh, that a message should be sent from, the address that you're sending to, and then the actual message that you're trying to send. Uh, and then basically the protocol would repeat at that point. Uh, and the other branch is stop, basically quit, end the protocol. Um, whoops. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the, the bang symbol is the send, uh, and these are the things that you're sending, and then basically you, you repeat and uh, quit, protocol is over. On the server side, uh, it's basically a complete dual of this. So the, instead, of the, uh, instead of the little plus operator, we have this, this and symbol, which is uh, basically a, a dual of the plus instead of, uh, instead of selecting, you're offering a choice uh, between the following branches on the server side. Uh, it's the same, sort of same, it's exactly the same thing um, as, as before. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the, you know, the high level sort of like definition of, a, of, of the client and the server in this application. And this would be the implementation of the client. Doesn't really matter so much, um, you know, the details except uh, all of the, the you know, all, you should just note that all of the C's here, I got like var C1, var C2, var C3. Um, everything is returning uh, a new channel endpoint upon being uh, bound on each send, so um, that's why you see all of these things. But you know, here we are uh, using, like, selecting this EHLO. Uh, we're doing all of our sends. When we're done, uh, we're quitting basically. And what the compiler does in this case is it just makes sure it sort of, you know, well, there's a whole there's a whole very interesting type system behind this. But basically, if this type checks, then you're guaranteed that uh, sort of this protocol will be be correct. And the cool thing is, um, you know, there's, I, I actually showed you a code example. Um, most of the time when you read about this stuff, it's, it's very formal. Um, it's mostly, you know, it's, it's mostly actually the type systems that you, that you find when you pick up an academic paper. But uh, the cool thing to note is that there are many implementations of these things in, in you know, in the wild. Um, Ones that you might have heard of, uh, so Rust has one. So these are the names of the packages in case you, you care about Googling any of these languages. Um, so in Rust, so there's a package called Session Types. Uh, in Scala, there's one called L Channels. Um, but we have them also in languages like Erlang, Haskell, Python. Um, there's several Java ones. There's a well-known uh, implementation called Scribble. Um, and uh, it's also important to note that, remember I said some of these are multi-party, some of these are binary. Um, 
so the, I think Rust and Scala's and Haskell's are binary, the rest are multi-party, but, you know, details. Um, it's, the, the important thing to walk away with is, is basically that, you know, these things are actually implemented. They're not just a cute little, you know, uh, thought exercise. Um, and actually, one thing that's really cool about ICFP being co-located with, uh, with, with Strangeloop is that the people who, who work on these are here, actually. I mean, I, at least I saw them yesterday. Maybe they're still here today. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you see one of these guys and you're really interested in, in, in these things, you know, tell them, right? They're, I'm sure they're very excited to know that people are interested in using these things. Um, and again, I, I have to say, if, you're, if you want to learn more about them, uh, Simon Fowler's article is really cool. Uh, I, I encourage you to have a look. Um, so those are the two kind of clusters that I wanted to mention about, you know, all this activity going on, right? So you have people worrying about consistency and how to, like, reason about it, and you've got people worrying about, uh, you know, how to type these communication protocols, and there's a lot of activity around those things. Um, but there's a bunch of other cool things that don't fit into those categories that are potentially interesting or useful to practice. Uh, one that I, I, I've uh, read about recently is called WIP. Um, it's a, a contract system for microservices. That's cool, right? Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about this because I think that uh, the academic community hasn't given enough attention to these things. I mean, it's, I mean, everybody in this audience is probably like, oh God, don't say the microservice word um, because you know, <laughs> it's just all over the place, right? And everybody's using them and building them with them. Um, and you know, okay, everybody is, is doing this, but we're not, you know, maybe with our type systems and things, we're not really, I don't know, there's not that much that we're, we're doing to try and help you on the academic front. So I'm really excited about this WIP uh, work. Uh, which basically, I mean, um, to give you a quick taste, um, it, uh, you know, it, 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 what makes it stand apart from other academic works is the fact that, uh, you know, it, it takes sort of um, design decisions and sort of has goals that are really embracing this whole issue, or issue, uh, situation, whatever you want to call it, of there being umpteen zillion uh, microservices that you have to, to manage and deal with. Um, so the, the sort of design of this thing was based on the idea that it would always have to operate under some sort of partial deployment. Um, it would be transparent. It wouldn't mess with your communication. Um, it would be language agnostic. So if you're implementing all of your services in different languages, like it's not getting in your way. Uh, and finally, that uh, there should be some sort of loose coupling between that and sort of Thrift or, or some other um, uh, you know, wire protocol that, that you might be interested in using. That's awesome, right? Um, and so what, it's, what it does is, uh, you know, it, it, so, you know, it basically guarantees that uh, you end up using um, services correctly, I guess. It's like having almost like a dynamic type in between them, uh, which is neat. Um, another thing that I want to mention exists. I don't know much about it yet. I'm going to go bother these people soon. Um, you, should also, you should also follow this. It looks interesting. Um, this is a programming language that uh, folks from the Scala community uh, have started building recently. Um, and it's a, it's a Haskell-like language which, where you can move uh, computation around. Uh, and these computations, that are, they're kind of just, you know, interpreted uh, on, 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 you know, arbitrary nodes, which is cool and also potentially scary. So I would love to learn more about this. And they have an unconference session. I think it's tonight. So if you actually have more questions, you can go, go see it. But this is something that's really cool because it's kind of in the, the space of research. It's not in the sort of mainstream, one of the main threads of research. But it's, it's, it's interesting, and it's happening right now. Um, another thing that's uh, very neat, uh, which reminds me a lot of uh, this language called Linda sometimes, um, <laughs> is a language that uh, Tony Garnick-Jones uh, Tony Garnick uh, designed called Syndicate. Um, and what's really interesting about this language is that it has this notion of data spaces, which is like a tuple space, a little bit, but a little nicer. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, just you should know about this and, you know, maybe read one of the tutorials or something that he's, I think he's written a tutorial or something, or at worst case, read his thesis. He writes beautifully. Um, and one other thing that I'd like to mention before I start kind of uh, winding down is um, there's a piece of work um, which kind of predates a lot of this fad. Uh, which I, I found pretty interesting while I was doing my PhD. It's, called, uh, it's a programming language called ML5, which tries to reason about um, locations and whatnot in the type system. Um, and you know, they, ha they have ideas of, like mobile closures and things like this, and it's a, it's a of course, ML5. It's a variant of ML. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's ahead of its time, I think. Um, and this is something that we did recently. Um, it's a programming model. It's not even a... a, a um, a language of any kind. It's basically like a, I actually spoke about this a couple of years ago at Strangeloop. It's a, uh, you can think of it as like a, uh, 
um, a distributed sort of immutable data structure where everything is, you're applying functions to other locations in the network, uh, kind of turns the idea of message passing like backwards. Um, and so that's weird because it doesn't fit into any category either. Um, and sort of, whoops. Uh, with that, I wanted to kind of give a bird's eye view of some of the things that uh, at least, you know, I, I work in this space um, and some of the things that I think are interesting that we're, we're beginning to work on now that I'm like four and a half weeks or something into my, my job. <laughs> um, so one, one thing that's pretty neat that uh, actually we started with uh, Chris Micklejohn, Zeeshan Lakani, and Peter Alvaro um, was this kind of tongue-in-cheek paper that was rejected in flames. Um, it was, a, it was a workshop paper though, so I mean, it was, must have been really angering if it was a workshop paper that was rejected in flames. Um, basically, it's a, it, you know, the, the title is maybe also pissed people off. Verifying interfaces between container-based components, and then in tiny letters, or a type system by any other name. Uh, so the idea, we were, in this paper, we were proposing this idea of, of actually trying to provide types uh, to sort of check configurations between components. And this is, oops, this is something that uh, Adelbert Chang and I have been recently talking about a lot. Uh, and I think we're gonna get going on it very soon. And the idea is that you know, maybe we can come up with a type system and then sort of not have it really like a language that you have to deal with in your, in your actual uh, uh, you know, implementation of anything, but it could be something that you could be deploying as part of your CI to make sure that certain components uh, that you know, are in your system adhere to some invariant that some other component or some other service has so that you know, when, you, when you deploy something uh, and it breaks some invariant to some other team's service that you, know, you have no idea what their invariants are, at least you can catch this in the CI uh, rather than having to sort of be woken up in the middle of the night to figure out what the heck happened. Um, so this is something that we're getting started on. Uh, and then another project that we've been working on a little bit, um, or has been working on for a little while now, um, this with the, my student Kevin Clancy, is actually a type system to ensure that functions are monotone, which sounds like gibberish maybe. But <laughs> what that is, is uh, so if you kind of, we roll back to the CRDT stuff, it turns out that you can really easily screw those things up. Uh, if you're implementing them yourself, you can sort of, um, uh, sort of you know, violate some of the invariants that have to hold in order to ensure that this sort of eventual consistency thing happens. And uh, one of those sort of properties that always has to hold is that sort of operations on these things are monotone, like for some definition of monotone. Uh, and wouldn't it be cool if you know, maybe we could have something check that what you did is actually monotone when people are implementing their own CRDTs. Uh, so that's the idea of that work, and that's going to be, uh, that's something that is basically completely Greek for now, and one day hopefully we hope we can actually implement it in a system that would be able to be used by people. Uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of also on the, I, I pointed out, it's kind of also on the fringe, like it's not the, the thing that everybody else is doing, we're kind of like on the edge doing weird stuff. Um, and so that's kind of the stuff that we're working on uh, recently. Um, and um, I also want to call out, you know, I, I showed a bunch, of, a bunch of areas. I quickly flashed up a bunch of papers. Uh, I think that's very, I don't know, inhumane. I like to show faces. <laughs> so um, there are a number of people working in this space. I actually know some of them, don't know others. I follow their work. Um, but if you're actually, if, if you think any of this stuff is interesting, um, you know, the, the best thing to do is actually to, you know, take note of some of these folks and follow their work. Um, because these are the people who are usually year after year kind of publishing interesting results in this space. Um, and, uh, you know, I also want to point out that um, I have a ridiculous number of references, um, which, you know, offline, when you, if, you're interest, if you're interested in learning more about any of these things, you can use, make this like a, a choose your own adventure story where you can like dig down one of these random uh, paths that I've, I've presented before you. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll see, so there's a few, a few pages of this. I don't know if you follow any of the academic sort of, um, uh, you know, conferences. This is where, so in academia, uh, at least in, in computer science, the main results are presented usually in conferences. And ICFP was one of them. Uh, there's like four big ones every year, and this was one of the big ones, and it was co-located with Strangeloop. Uh, so you'll see there was actually a paper that was presented the other day about uh, fault-tolerant functional reactive programming, which was a functional pro, it was pretty cool. Um, but, you know, PLDI, uh, ESOP, POPL, um, ECOOP, these are all acronyms, but they're also academic conferences where they're publishing usually work related to 
programming models and programming languages. Um, and uh, there's actually, so I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of this work happening mostly in the programming languages space. So I have many pages of, of references just in the last few years of, of sort of the programming languages community. Um, I kind of stopped in, uh, in, in 2006, I think, uh, because it started getting more sparse by then. Um, but that just shows you, in the last 10, 12 years, really there's been like a great uptick and I'm, I'm sort of happy that that's happening because you know, as we are dealing with more things like microservices appearing and then you know, they're wonderful for some reasons and awful for other reasons, uh, you know, I'm glad that the academic community is taking a look at things like this. Um, and there's a, a number of other um, references which I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave for you, um, several famous references. Uh, things like uh, node on distributed computing and the fallacies of distributed computing, things that, you know, if you're interested, again, in distributed systems or distributed computing, you should be aware of these things. Um, and I'm, I'm posting these uh, with my slides uh, up at this link right after, right after the talk. Um, and with that, I'm um, actually just about, oh, a um, couple minutes. I still have a couple minutes, but I'm happy to answer questions. So questions are, are they, are they still Sledo? I, can, I actually, yep. Sorry, man. Or do I do it? All right. Then I can choose what I want to answer now. <laughs> Nobody can choose for me, ha ha. It's SL18, right? Yep, got it. Are you guys tired? Oh no. Yep, I got it. Hooray. Oh, cool, all right. I already got two questions, awesome. So Yarn Minsky asks, what do you think about the relationship between mixed consistency models for distributed systems and work on memory models for multi-core systems? That's a good question. Um, so I don't know, I, I, think, I think that people often look at distributed, anything in the distributed space as sort of an extension of concurrent whatever, like choose, choose, a, choose a topic and then they try to extend the concurrent case to the distributed case. And um, I think that, I mean, personally, I, I just think that there's a, a number of things that, uh, you know, come up, like latency and other things that it would be nice if there was some way to actually reason about that, which I, I don't see happening when you're thinking about different memory models for multi-core systems. Um, and also, I mean, you know, so, so I guess the answer to my question is that, uh, you know, I think that there are additional concerns which, uh, you know, often don't pop up in that scenario. Uh, so I think it, it requires sort of different attention given to it. This is like very lonely, you guys. I don't know about this, 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 this uh, asking questions via, via app. Um, is there a research at the intersection of political science and CS relating to motion, storage of data and algorithms and impacts on distributed systems? Uh, actually, I have no idea. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, intersection of political science and CS, I don't know anything about political science, so you're asking the wrong person, sorry. Um, and um, uh, so I have qu a, a question asking what, what, is, what do I mean by monotone in terms of CRDTs? Um, so you can, okay, so this can actually become an involved definition, but uh, the simple way to think of it is that uh, you've got something that's always increasing, like an operation that's always causing some sort of increase. Um, in one case, you, it could be just always increasing the size of the data structure and like not destroying it, for example. Um, so this is what I mean by like a monotonic function. Uh, it's kind of, you know, increase, in general, this idea of, of increasing it for some definition of what am I increasing. Um, yeah, wow. Uh, Dave D. asks, is there any overlap in research between session types and CRDTs? That's a good question. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm a scatterbrain with like umpteen zillion papers that I try to keep track of and just sort of like running through what I'm aware of. I, I, no specific paper comes up where like, I mean, I don't, I mean, where session types and CRDTs try to to do anything together that I'm aware of. I mean, that doesn't mean they don't exist. It's just that I have not 
tripped over this one. Um, okay, uh, another question by Noah. Um, have you done any work with Erlang, Elixir, and OTP? Uh, what's your general opinion on, on uh, the actor model? So I come from Scala land, man. I like, I like my types. <laughs> Uh, we have actors, right? <laughs> Although I have to point out that, uh, you know, so the actor model in Scala was borrowed from, from uh, Erlang, and uh, we have this wonderful, like, any to unit type, or not type, whatever. Actors are a partial function from any to unit, which is, if you like types, it's a very useless type. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I have to say that uh, you know every time I start trying to use the actor model in Scala, I'm having a great time, loving it, loving it, loving it, and then the sort of lack of typing sort of drives me a little bit nuts. Um, and uh, I don't, I mean, other than like playing around, building stupid little example applications in Erlang, I've really been firmly uh, in Scala land, and then comparing sort of aspects of Erlang to Scala, but never actually working in Erlang. Um, to answer your question, but uh, you know, I, I am I, I love the actor model for for the record. Uh, although, yes, I mean, uh, I'm starting to enjoy Roland Kuhn's uh, typed actors <laughs> and and Akka, uh, a lot more lately. Oh no, it's hard to see. Now things are out of order. Oh my God. No, wait, I have one more, okay. Are you trying to kick me off? Fine. Um, okay, one more from John Hughes and then I'll let you escape, all right? Um, so John Hughes asks, do you think low, very low power settings like sensor networks that only communicate occasionally can use the same abstractions? That's a, that's a very good question, actually, because uh, this is something that I think whenever you start talking about like edge and blah, blah, people start getting, like they trip over it a lot. Um, you know, they, ask, they think immediately like a sensor network or something that's power constrained. And um, actually, a lot of these things that I care about, uh, I'm assuming that they're not power constrained. Uh, so in the case of like the CRDTs, I'm assuming that you, got, you can run uh, something on it which has like a garbage collector, right? <laughs> um, and that, you know, you don't have to worry about the thing wasting cycles yet. Um, so at the moment, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really focused on sort of these, these uh, you know, edge or sort of smallish devices uh, sort of being power constrained. I'm more interested in things like mobile phones. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I'm over time. So I will let you guys go. Thank you for, thank you for the very animated question session. <laughs>